Good afternoon, and welcome to session three of the 2020 CNAS Annual Conference Summer Series, America Competes. My name is Kara Frederick, Fellow in the Technology and National Security Program at CNAS. You are watching the second tech-focused session of the day, Is Seeing Still Believing? Synthetic Media and the Liberal Uses of Technology. This session will have three components. Number one, an interactive challenge that will test your ability to spot manipulated media from a series of video, static images, text, and audio. How good are you, the viewer, at determining what is real and what is automated? Two, after the exercise, I will discuss the results and implications for the information environment with Axios media reporter, Sarah Fisher. We'll talk tech-enabled media manipulation, disinformation, foreign influence campaigns, and the media landscape as it relates to the upcoming US presidential election and democratic institutions around the world. Third, after that, stay tuned for a discussion that brings all of this together with three members, four now, of the CNAS Digital Freedom Forum. We'll have Maya Wang, the Senior Researcher for China at Human Rights Watch, Danica Lazuk, who runs Beta Lab at BetaWorks Ventures, which is a startup studio and seed stage VC firm with a focus on the intersection of technology and media, Ann Kokas, the Professor of Media Studies at UVA, and Sheena Greitens, Professor at the University of Texas' LBJ School with a focus on Asia, authoritarian politics, and national security. All of our panelists are experts on synthetic media, China, or emerging technology, and in some cases, all three. Our speakers are also members of the CNAS Digital Freedom Forum. The forum is a vehicle for bringing today's cutting edge researchers, tech companies, and current and former policymakers together to find solutions to the illiberal use of technology. We'll put out the forum's final set of recommendations for whoever takes office in 2021 this winter as well as a new report on the future of digital surveillance coming this fall. Our Digital Freedom Forum members here today will focus specifically on how the United States should respond to the illiberal use of technology abroad. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, if you see or hear anything that inspires you to ask a question of any of our panelists or Sarah Fisher or amplify it on social media, then please use hashtag CNAS2020 on Twitter for any comments or to ask a question. I do wanna take a moment to recognize our conference sponsors, Bank of America, Huntington Ingalls, Microsoft, Palace Advisors, Qualcomm, and UPS. And thank you to our media partner, Axios, and all of our institutional donors for helping us bring together this group of outstanding individuals as part of our conference series this summer. With that, I'd like to introduce other members of our technology and national security team. Researchers Megan Lamberth and Iniki Rakonin to kick off the Synthetic Media Challenge. Megan and Iniki, over to you. Thank you, Kara. Hello, everyone. I'm Megan Lamberth, a research assistant here on the CNAS Technology and National Security Program. Hi, everyone. My name is Iniki. I'm the other research, research assistant on the tech team and Megan's forever partner in crime. I'm really excited to co-host this exercise with you all. Um, we'll be talking about synthetic media and we're very lucky today actually to have some opening remarks from Kim Kardashian. When there's so many haters, I really don't care because their data has made me rich beyond my wildest dreams. My decision to believe in Spectre literally gave me my ratings and my fan base. I feel really blessed because I genuinely love the process of manipulating people online for money. So a short disclaimer for ethical and all other kinds of reasons is that this video is not real. It does derive from a real video that Ms. Kardashian did with Vogue, but these are certainly not her words. Artists Bill Posters and Daniel Howe worked with AI startups to create this particular clip. You can manipulate people online for money, as she says, and you can manipulate them for power as well. Adversaries are already manipulating the information space to push their narratives or widen divides among Americans. AI will play an increasing role in this. One area of potential abuse of AI comes in the form of synthetic media and deepfakes. Synthetic media is media that's been manipulated or entirely generated. Deepfakes are media that have been created or altered with machine learning tools, in particular deep learning tools. And this is where the term deepfake comes from. 
The power of AI tools is that it can make the process of manipulating media easier and much more accessible. It can basically become turbocharged Photoshop at the click of a button. And just like Photoshop, deepfakes aren't inherently good or bad, just a little bit prone to abuse. This abuse has implications for disinformation. Some synthetic media, like this GIF that was retweeted by the president in April, are easy to spot because the manipulation is very obvious. In this particular example, the original poster used a free app that relies on computer vision, which is an AI system that recognizes things in the world to break the image down into parts that animation tools can manipulate. Other examples, like this profile of Katie Jones, a fictitious CSIS employee, are less obvious unless you look a little bit more closely. In this generated image, the hair strands are a little bit inconsistent around the edges, there's an artifact on her ear that's not quite an earring. Her ear looks a little confused whether there's you know, little baby hairs over it or not. The crinkles on her cheek look approximated but not exact. If you're familiar with the clues, they aren't all that hard to find. I was actually pretty surprised the first time I saw the Kardashian clip and only caught the visual clues not the first time when I was so surprised by it or the second time when I was still surprised by it, but the third time when I started to go look for them. So if you look in that green box just there on your screen, her hair kind of seems to stick to her jaw while she speaks, as do the wrinkles on her shirt collar, which makes sense because the manipulation is around her mouth and the words she say. The audio to me sounds very real, but the content really stood out. The secondary problem with synthetic media is that it leaves a shadow of a doubt. That question about what's real, even when something is, that's been termed the liar's dividend. If Kim K did join a shadowy organization named Spectre and started to steal data to manipulate you online for money, one could easily dismiss a hot mic confession as a fake. For now, we can spot most fakes, whether they're video, image, audio, or text, with their eyes or ears or with technical tools. Something doesn't really seem right, or we'll learn what artifacts to look for to identify manipulation. But synthetic media is only getting harder to spot. It's getting cheaper and easier to produce. Technology companies and policymakers are racing to find the tools to contain them. Megan, over to you. Thanks, Heineke. In advance of the interview with Axios's Sarah Fisher in our esteemed panel, we'd like to offer just a snapshot of the synthetic media present. Over the next few minutes, we will be sharing some examples of synthetic media and are curious which ones you can spot from the real ones. We encourage you to look and listen very carefully. And if you're tuning in at conference.cnas.org slash live, please use the panel to the right of or below uh, your video screen to vote for which one you believe has been manipulated in some way. You can also use the chat function to interact with other audience members and with us. We would love to hear from you throughout the exercise. And finally, you can engage with us on Twitter by using the hashtag CNAS2020. So let's get started. We'll start with just some simple static images. On each of the next four slides, you will see two images. One of these images is real, has not been manipulated at all. And the other is computer generated using an algorithm called StyleGAN2. And as you will see, StyleGAN2 can generate images from scratch that on the surface look very, very real. So we'll start with these first two images. You will have 10 seconds, just 10 seconds, to vote for which image you think is computer generated, which one you think is fake. So please vote now on the right of your screens. And I know 10 seconds seems pretty short, but we're trying to simulate the amount of time that one would normally spend looking at an image on Facebook or Twitter or Google or something. And so when you're scrolling online, you know, you normally don't take very much time looking at each image or each post, or at least I know I don't. All right, and while we're waiting for our poll results to come in, um, Megan, you sent me actually a really interesting article this morning uh, on deepfakes that I thought would be relevant. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Remind yeah me. <laughs> absolutely. There was this uh, really great article that Reuters put out this morning, uh, super fascinating, about a fake online persona named Oliver Taylor. Uh, and Oliver's online profiles described him. He said he was enrolled as a university student. He's a big coffee lover and political news junkie. He just sounded like, you know, a normal, a normal guy. Uh, and this persona had actually pitched a number of articles to several different online publications and, and several of which were published. Uh, and it turns out Oliver Taylor, uh, this persona 
does not exist. It's entirely fabricated. And his profile picture, in fact, is a deep fake. It was, an, it was a forgery. So I'd encourage our audience uh, after this to go check out that article on Reuters from earlier this morning, because it shows you just a real world example of how this technology can be used for ill purposes sometimes. Aniki, how are the uh, poll results looking? So our poll results are in and Megan, to be honest, I'm a little bit relieved. 92% um, of our audience voted for A is the fake. All right, great job, everyone. This one was kind of a gimme. Uh, you can see the person on the right, image B is very much real and is in fact you, Aniki. Uh, but you may be asking yourself, how in the world can you spot a fake? So let's take a closer look for a second at image A. If you look closely, you'll see that the eyelashes on her right eye and left eye are different. The eyelashes on the right are more pronounced. Looks like she may be wearing mascara, while the eyelashes on her left eye are less noticeable. Under her chin, if you can see in that green box, you can see that it looks like her hair is almost sticking to her chin in an unnatural way, like just individual strands of hair, which doesn't seem normal. Aineke, was there something that stuck out to you in particular? Certainly, I wouldn't fault someone from leaving the house with mascara on one side. I think we've the best of us have been there as well. I would draw attention though to the side with what I've been calling deep falsies, um, those extra long lashes. And for me, what stood out about it is that the system seems to have conflated, you know, the appearance of eye crinkles with the appearance of eyelashes. And so, you know, it's given you something that's not quite exact, but rather is an approximation of sort of both objects. Yeah, that is so true. All right, everyone. So now that we're a little warmed up, let's move on to our next set of images. This one will be a bit harder. I promise it does not include a CNAS colleague. So here we go. Remember, you have 10 seconds. Please vote now for which image you think is computer generated, which one you think is fake. Image A on the left or image B on the right. And remember to look closely at the person's hair, uh, at the person's eyes, any jewelry the person might be wearing. This can sometimes give you clues to the authenticity. And while we're waiting for the poll results, Heineke, didn't you write something recently uh, in Strategic Studies Quarterly about deepfakes? I did. Um, it came out in November, which feels like years and years ago at this point. Um, but yeah. I actually used that example of Katie Jones, that fictitious CSIS person. And um, as that story had come out, um, interestingly, there were a lot of stories as well about um, adversarial governments perhaps trying to do recruitment operations over social media, whether that was Facebook or LinkedIn. It's that you know that classic networking game of who do you know, who do they know, who they who they know. Sure. And so there was there was a little bit of speculation about whether this came from a foreign adversary. Um, and in this spirit, I just want to touch on a question that we received from the audience. And the question is, manipulated media is such a big challenge, but I do think humorous examples of manipulated media can distract from the real danger. How can we bridge that gap? And so again, I think some of the challenge here is that it is dual use. It's not all good. It's not all bad. But when you put it within the context of what our adversaries are doing, um, there's a big challenge there. So I would say, you know, don't be afraid, but we have to look for solutions that bridge that contextual use of this technology. That is very true. Heineke, oh. are, the, uh, are the results in? The poll results are in, and we've had 46% of our audience refer to image B as the fake. 46%. All right, so this one tripped a, little, a few people up because uh, image B is in fact the fake. It was computer generated. And I know the first time when Aineke was testing me on these pictures, I also got this wrong. But if you look closely, there are some subtle things that are off about this picture. First, the thread in the knitting on her beanie looks discolored in places, or just looks like it changes in certain, in certain places on her head. And behind her, the background of the photo is kind of odd. It looks like maybe she's in a forest, uh, but there's, which is highlighted in the screen box, there's like kind of a blob on the side it's kind of undistinguishable. Um, so remember to keep these things in mind as we move forward. Aineke, were there some giveaways for you in this picture? There were, but I did cheat a little bit by actually picking these examples. Um, if you go to a website called thispersondoesnotexist.com and just hit refresh, it'll just give you, you know, essentially infinite numbers of deep fakes to try to spot the fakes. And so for me, part of putting this exercise together, it was interesting to try to pick real photos that might trip people up because Megan, again, as you said, Often we'll look to the background to see where the manipulation is. Um, but you know, I worry that, say, someone takes Photoshop and is extremely skilled with making manual edits and takes a fake person out of a foreground, inserts a different background. And so 
um, you know, there's a question of, yeah, I think it'll only get harder from here. Yeah, that's true. So audience, keep everything that Einike just said in mind as we move on to this next set of images. You may find this one to be a little bit trickier. So take a moment, look at all the details, the hair, the eyes, the dividing line between their skin and their clothing. Look for anything that might give you a clue. Uh, and please vote now. Again, it's on the right of your screen. You have 10 seconds. And if you're just now joining us, welcome. I'm Megan Labreth, and I'm here with my colleague, Einike Rickinen. We're in the middle of hosting an exercise on synthetic media, which is media that's been manipulated or generated using AI tools. And right now we're asking folks to vote for which image they think has been manipulated or computer generated. So please feel free to jump right in, engage with us using the chat bar on the right of your screen or on Twitter with the hashtag CNAS2020. We'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. And it looks like our results are just about starting to come in now. All right. And 54% of our audience, so almost, it's just a, almost about half and half, um, voted for B as the fake. All right. Good job to 54% of you. You are correct. Image B uh, is fake, it was created with the Style GAN 2 algorithm. So let's take a closer look at this one. Because to me, this image has some subtle and then some more obvious giveaways. To me, the dividing line between the individual's hat and his hair was the first giveaway. Because uh, it seems like his hair is kind of blurring into his, his hat. If you don't know where one ends and the other begins. And then more subtly, the collar on his left side seems to almost blur into his neckline a little bit. The wrinkles of his skin look a little off. And finally, the frame of his glasses also seems to be uh, a bit odd. Did the glasses stick out to you, Einike? They did, but for slightly different reasons. And the reason is that if you were to play this game a couple of months ago, glasses would have been a dead giveaway at first, gla uh, first glance, rather. You know, you'd see a shadow of a frame, a ghost of a lens, that hipster thing where there's maybe no lenses, a missing uh, stem. But in this case, actually, like while, while you can kind of tell, it, at least it's a complete pair of glasses. It's a big improvement. Yeah, that is so true. And I think it's so, it's a, it highlights just the speed at which the technology is developing. Like it's not just a matter of years, it's a matter of months and weeks a lot of times. Uh, all right, so switching it up a little bit for this last set of static images, you can see that not only can StyleGAN2 generate faces, uh, it can also generate cats. Again, one of these images is real and the other has been generated entirely from scratch. So please vote now. Remember you have 10 seconds uh, on which cat you believe is fake image A on the left or image B on the right. Um, and just to continue your point, Megan, while we're waiting for our polling results is that, you know, you can do faces, you can do cats, you can also do other things. And again, going back to our audience question, some examples are fun and some are less fun. For instance, you know, what if someone starts to generate pictures of tanks, you know, or ICBMs or something more serious like that? I think there are a couple of people in our audience who probably know when to point out, actually, like that's a Bradley fighting vehicle. But you know, certainly you can see more serious applications of this technology in the future. Yeah, for us mere mortals that don't know the difference, uh, it would, yeah, it could certainly pose some challenges. Okay. And here are the uh, results in? Yes, they've just come in. Awesome. We've Great. had 87%, 87% of our audience voted for B is the fake. Great, nice job, everyone. 87% uh, of you are correct. The cat on the right is fake, it's computer generated. And I attest, for those that got this one wrong, I probably would have also gotten this wrong if I didn't know the cat on the left belonged to you, Einike. I can't believe it either some days. Uh, let's take a closer look at this one. Because when you look closely at the cat's front legs, uh, you can see that the paws seem to blur into the surrounding grass a little bit. It almost looks like part of his paw is made up of grass. Uh, and then dishing the small gap near uh, the cat's back legs also looks unnatural, like in an in actual picture of an actual cat that wouldn't be there. Um, so remember to keep all of these things in mind when you're scrolling online. Uh, and great job, everyone. This concludes the first part of our exercise, and hopefully it will help you in the future determine the authenticity of static images. Over to you, Einike. Thank you, Megan. We'll change the pace a little bit with some video, and especially you know, we might take the uh, difficulty up just a half notch here. Synthetic media can be built from scratch or it can be a manipulation of real media. The examples you see now um, 
one of the pair has a deep fake edit to the eyes. And so again, go to that panel on the right of your screen and vote for which one you feel has been manipulated. I think part of what's so interesting as well about videos that we've seen some pretty prominent examples of cheap fakes earlier this year. And cheap fakes are sort of what we've called conventionally edited media. Um, we had one example where Speaker Pelosi was made to appear to splur her speech and journalist Jim Acosta appeared to karate chop an intern at the White House. So, you know, certainly I think there's a concern if people are believing things that have been edited in a more rudimentary way, what happens when the challenge becomes much more difficult. Yeah, that's true, because there is a danger, of course, of, of deep fake technology that is, you know, is advancing quickly, but um, right now we certainly have concerns about just conventionally edited media. And it looks like the poll results are in, Eineke. Uh, right. It looks like 66% of people voted for video B. 66% of people would be correct. Well done. I was looking at this and thinking, you know, I would love to have deep faked eyeliner on for all my Zoom calls these days. But right? alas, you all know that that's perfectly real. All right, and we'll have a second video example here. And for those of you just joining us for running an exercise on synthetic media, please visit the panel to the right of your screen and vote for which you think has been manipulated. And again, we're looking at the eyes of these people. And Aniki, these are so good. Uh, while we're waiting for the results to come in, where did you find these examples? Um, these particular ones come from the MIT Media Lab as part of their Detect Fakes project. And so unlike with the still images, unfortunately, I don't have any magic tricks for you on how to tell which is which. Um, if you'd like to let us know what you saw, hashtag CNS2020 again. Um, but for these, I picked examples that I myself failed. But the good news is that MIT's Detect Fakes project seeks to build technical tools to spot deep fakes that a person, including myself, might miss. Some of the same universities that are on the cutting edge of building the technology to create synthetic media are also scrambling to create the tools to detect them. We've got an ongoing cat and mouse game, and I'm not really sure where the bottom is on this one. Yeah, and on the detection front, um, Facebook too just announced last month the conclusion of their deep fake detection challenge that all these researchers from around the globe create and submit different models that attempted to determine the authenticity of a video. Um, and so the initial results were actually pretty promising, which is exciting. Um, the algorithms certainly need work, but the accuracy level was actually much better than expected, which is good. Uh, and it looks like the poll results are in, Eineke. 37% uh, of people voted for video A. And 37% minority would be correct. Video A is the manipulated video. Over to you, Megan. All right, as we've seen, synthetic media can come in the form of image and video, but it can also come in the form of text. In this example, one of the paragraphs of text is genuine, and the other was generated by a language model from OpenAI called GPT-2. Please vote now for which paragraph you think is fake generated using the GPT-2 model. This technology is really interesting. Uh, and as OpenAI explains, GPT-2 can, quote, generate coherent paragraphs and perform rudimentary reading comprehension, machine translation, question answering, and summarization. Uh, and synthetic text can be challenging, if not impossible to trace, since the output is entirely unique. Right. And I think there's pros and cons for this. You know, I could definitely see people who are into creative writing and such um, use it as a tool to help get past writer's block or something. But on the other hand, you might have some enterprising students um, looking to create text that gets past plagiarism checkers. So I think the applications are all across the board here. Yeah, definitely. Um, and as we're waiting for the results to come in, uh, there's a question that's come in through social media. Uh, what are the ethics of making deep fakes? Is there a way they can be used for good? Uh, and this is a great question. Um, I think you often hear about the ill purposes, um, how it's been used in um, like the pornography industry and uh, how it can be used to impact elections or governance um, for ill purposes. But certainly social media companies have responded to the satirical uses or those for like uh, comic purposes. And that's just a couple of, um, of more lighthearted uses for deep fakes, but it's certainly not all bad. All right, Megan, looks like our polling results are in and 69% of our audience voted for A is the fake. 
Great, good job, 69% of you. Uh, you are in fact right. Uh, paragraph A is fake created with the GPT-2 model. And as you can see, if we've given you a bit more time to, uh, this example is, is relatively easy because while the generated text on the left is constructed correctly, includes the right buzzwords and the right phrases, uh, it's not really saying anything. It lacks any real context. And overall, while the GPT-2 model was an impressive feat, this was a real weakness of the language model. However, just recently, OpenAI produced GPT-3, a better and much, much bigger language model. And you may find this next example to be a little more challenging. So as a reminder, one paragraph of text is real while the other was generated using the GPT-3 language model. So the poll should be open. Please give us your best judgment. And for those of you just now joining us, I know it's a Wednesday afternoon. Um, this is Megan Lambert. I'm Ainiki Rikkonen. We are research assistants on the tech team at CNES and we're running an exercise on synthetic media. So please vote for which you feel is the fake to the right of your screen. If you'd like to engage with us in the chat, feel, please feel free to do so or hashtag CNES2020 on Twitter. All right, and it looks like we're still, we've got a slight delay here on the text. Uh, so while we're waiting, I was thinking of some like more fun applications of language models. And I uh, found this article of a group of researchers that created this really neat AI pro program called Deep Spear uh, that's been trained to write sonnets. And so it's not perfect yet. And the researchers have talked about it. It's not perfect, but uh, the technology is you know, improving really, really fast. Um, so maybe we'll see some, some new generated writings, you know, similar to like William Shakespeare, which would be really cool. That'd be super cool. All right. Oh, it looks like our poll results, results are just coming in, just in the nick of time. And 45% of our audience voted for B is the fake. And, you know, I do, I do worry that when we're 50-50 if people are guessing. So let us know, <laughs> hashtag CNS2020, what you think. Yeah. So 45% of you are correct. The paragraph B on the right-hand side is a fake. Uh, and I told you this one was a little more challenging. Um, and while the generated text isn't perfect, the argument that paragraph B makes is much better. The contextual pieces are, are much better. Um, and there's just a more coherent argument throughout. And this just showcases the speed at which natural language processing technology and other technology used to create synthetic media is developing. It's very, very fast. And so I've just got a quick public service announcement here um, for our audience. If you are seeing discrepancies between what you see in the polling and what um, Megan and I are telling you, um, it, since it's live, we'll get a snapshot of what the poll results are and we're leaving these open. So, um, you know, maybe it'll get more accurate as we tell you what the answer is and then people continue to vote. So we're gonna change the pace a little bit by offering some audio examples. In the two audio examples we're about to play, one was written by a famous classical composer and the other sample was written by a machine. So I'll play the first clip and then listen carefully. It's about 20 seconds long. Um, and then I'll play the second clip. And then again, we'll give you about 10 seconds to decide and vote using that panel to the right of your screen. So here's clip number one. That's clip number one. Now for clip number two. Again, it's about 20 seconds long and then you have about 10 seconds to vote. So we'll give you about 10 seconds to chew on that one and then let us know what you think. And again, one of those was written by a machine. The other one was written by a famous classical composer. I know the first time you tested me, Aniki, I totally got it wrong. I took years of piano lessons, so it's shameful. But this one is really fun, but tough. 
Yeah, I definitely feel that. I haven't played, I used to play violin, but haven't had the chance in some time. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of background on our composer while we're waiting for our results to come in. Um, Frederick Chopin was a Polish composer who died in the mid 1800s, um, but his spirit might live on in a deep neural network. So one of these clips comes from OpenAI's MuseNet. And MuseNet runs on GPT-2, which as we've seen can generate text as well. And what it does is it fills in the next element in a sequence. So that can be the next word in a sentence or the next note in a tune. All right, Megan, how are you looking on our polling results here? Yeah, they just came in. It looks like 51% of people voted for audio clip A. So a very slim majority would be correct. Um, clip A is indeed the computer generated one. And I understand that with a 20 second clip, it's really hard because like writing with words, music has phrases, themes, context, and logic across the broader piece. And so if you're curious to see if you can spot what makes these fake, um, please do check out MuseNet over at OpenAI. Music is pretty innocuous, but synthetic audio, whether generated or manipulated, it's not, it's not limited to music. It can include voices. So just as you can generate a face, you can generate a voice. One AI company sells real-time voice skins for gamers looking to change their persona or increase their anonymity online. Or you can also apply language translations onto someone else's voice. Chinese voice recognition and surveillance tech company iFlyTech has generated some interesting videos of Presidents Trump and Obama speaking in Mandarin. Yet another company with deep fake voice services lets you add words into podcasts in addition to trimming audio out so you can put entirely new words into someone's mouth. Deep fake audio has the potential to be abused for disinformation and criminal uses too. In 2019, criminals deep faked the voice of a CEO to steal money from his company over the phone. While manipulated videos have received a whole lot of media attention, I think in some ways, audio might be a more challenging problem. And the examples presented here are just a snapshot of the technological capabilities in existence today. The technology is not perfect, but is it, it is advancing really quickly. For instance, the technology used to create deep fakes, media that's been edited or synthesized using AI has made incredible strides in the last two to three years. The technology used to generate synthetic media is fast moving and rapidly improving. With time, synthetic media will be indistinguishable from the real stuff. We may very well be entering an era where seeing is no longer believing. But this is not the end of the world. Policymakers, social media companies, research labs, and technology researchers are working to address the proliferation of synthetic media. In recent months, social media companies have rolled out new policies combating manipulated media on their platforms. For instance, Twitter unveiled new policies on manipulated media earlier this year that allow it to label tweets that, it, that have been significantly altered or have been shared in a deceptive manner. Tech companies are also getting involved, funding research teams that are working to build deep fake detection software, which are tools that can be used to detect and flag manipulated content. And government agencies like DARPA and startups are also racing to build similar software that can verify the veracity of a video or audio clip. And policymakers too have proposed a number of bills addressing manipulated media, recognizing the acute danger it could pose to elections and governance. Going into the future, these groups, social media companies, lawmakers, researchers, and all of us will have to work in tandem to reduce the potentially harmful effects of manipulated media. Because synthetic media will continue to be a battle between the advancement of the technological capabilities used to create manipulated content versus the tools needed to detect it. This doesn't have to be a losing battle, but we must all do our part to prepare for it. CNAS is deeply interested in exploring the intersection between emerging technology and its impact on governments and democracy through the Center's Countering High-Tech Illiberalism Initiative and Digital Freedom Initiative. If you enjoyed today's exercise, we certainly encourage you to visit our website to check out some of our research. We'd like to thank Monica Bohart, the tech team's recent intern and research contractor for her efforts in helping to put this exercise together. We'd also like to thank the very brilliant artists and researchers who created a lot of this content and allowed us to share it with you all today. And finally, many thanks to all of you for participating. Now over to Kara Frederick for an interview with Axios's Sarah Fisher.
Thanks, Megan and Nikki. So I'm not really worried about our audience after that. I think I'm just more worried about my own ability to be a discerning consumer of digital media because I did not do very well. But never mind that. Uh, let's get a little more granular on what this means and why we should care. If you're just joining us, we wrapped up our synthetic media challenge presented by CNAS researchers, Aniki Rakonin and Megan Lambert. Don't forget to engage on Twitter using CNAS2020 as a hashtag. If you have a question for Sarah Fisher, who I'm about to bring on, or any of our upcoming panelists from the Digital Freedom Forum. But we'll turn to Sarah first. Axios media reporter Sarah Fisher focuses her work on breaking news and analysis of the media industry. You can subscribe to her weekly Axios Media Trends newsletter today, and she can be found on at Sarah Fisher on Twitter. Sarah, I thought that was really fascinating, and I actually didn't really anticipate all of those results given so many test runs that we've done, um, but it really seemed like nobody was actually very good or very bad at identifying static images. People were sort of somewhere in the middle. You know, the audience came out of the gates roaring and were pretty consistent at spotting the fake, but then you come to videos and everyone started out really well, and then they sort of stumbled a bit on a little more difficult example. As far as text, you know, it was pretty straightforward with language model GPT-2, you know, 69% of the audience got it right. But when we came to GPT-3, uh, it was much more difficult for our viewers, who I consider pretty highbrow. And, you know, it was split almost evenly with 55% uh, being wrong. So with Chopin and audio, you know, again, audience uh, very cultured, um, but 51% called the fake Chopin composition. Uh, that's not fantastic from what we expect of CNAS audiences. Um, so a little bit heartening, a little bit discouraging, but I would like to ask you as somebody who, who really has a position on the media landscape, you know, what do you think of the results? And, you know, what does that mean for the American citizenry's ability to, to really, in a word, call BS? on tech-enabled forgeries in the media environment. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me and thank you to CNAS. I think one of the issues is that you have two groups that can be easily manipulated and both have very different ramifications. To your point, you have the everyday American or the everyday citizen of the world who might encounter a deep fake audio, video, picture, or text on the internet and may not be able to discern whether or not it's real. Now, those... Uh, people are very dangerous because they could spread it further. That's the types of people that could help something go viral. But then the other constituency that could be manipulated is the media itself. And the reason why they are potentially a very dangerous audience for this is because the footprint of media with many followers on Twitter and on Instagram, et cetera, uh, is huge. And so if they're the ones that are tricked into, you know, publishing something from a deep fake, that also can have major ramifications. I'd say a combination of these two constituencies, both consumers who can't necessarily spot things being real online and even everyday reporters in the media could mean major risk for things like the 2020 election because it's going to be hard for people to discern and the media to discern what's real and what's fake in real time. Sarah, I find what you just brought up fascinating because our purview, you know, we we tend to think about how people who are consuming the information, you know, what our responsibility is, right? Um, the tech companies and whatnot are a different story, but you brought up media distributors. So I've been reading a little bit on, you know, Stanford Internet Observatory um, and members of our Digital Freedom Forum. They've really dug into the maturation of some of these tactics and techniques um, of, you know, influence campaigns, foreign influence campaigns, especially um, as they relate to Russia and China. China, and one conclusion they came up with was that some, you know, fringe media institutions and these new distributors are playing an increasingly important role in that distribution. Um, the Reuters article that Megan and I, Nikki alluded to, talks about, uh, and they use the words of Israeli startup chief Dan Brahmi, you know, that talks about how synthetic media helps build totally untraceable identities that factor heavily in a geopolitical context, right? So you brought in the idea of the media's responsibility. How, how are you looking to counter that? Is there any sort of groundswell of, hey, you know, we could actually be potential distributors of information or, you know, some of our, uh, you know, colleagues on the fringe could be distributors of information if they're not aware. Are there any movements to sort of take control of that other than, you know, what you just said and spreading that sort of awareness? 
Yeah, that's an excellent point. And I also wanted to just point out the media is a target here. When you take a look at a lot of these campaigns using deep fakes, they intentionally want to reach out to members of the media to see if they will distribute them. And so in, to ensure that you're not going to inadvertently spread something that's false, some of the things that media organizations can do is start to implement checks into the way that they verify information online when they do reporting. You know, there was a time where if someone tweeted something years ago, let's say it was them at the scene of a car crash, you reached out to them on Twitter and you say, hey, can I license your photo so that I could use it for my story or broadcast? Well, now we have to include a separate layer of verification because we don't know if things have been manipulated. And those layers of verification can look different from media organization to media organization. Some have layers of verification just internally. They're not bringing in outside experts. They're just saying to themselves, okay, does this look real? Does this look fake? Do we trust that source? Does this seem right? Others will consult outside layers to verify. So there are some really strong partners. People like Storyful is a really good example that help to verify images and photos and text in real time so that before the media reports on them, they can be assured that they are accurate. And then the last thing I think that the media is doing is that they're just participating in more training. Facebook funded a course from Reuters, which published that report that you alluded to earlier this year, that in many different languages helps newsrooms distribute courses to their journalists so that they can check what might be real and what might not be real. And that I think has been a really powerful tool. I think at the end of the day, it's not necessarily that people expect journalists to have all the tools and all the knowledge to do this themselves. Rather, you want to equip journalists with the knowledge of knowing who to call to verify something really quickly before you need to report on it. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, a lot of us in the national security world, we're not exactly clear on what's going on in the newsroom. So that's it's great to turn the tables on you and see, you know, what's happening from your point of view. And there's something, too, that I think is really interesting. So we talk about the pernicious effects of all of this. We talk about how it could, you know, end in woe and oppression and, you know, be used for um, ill and, you know, all the things that Megan and I Nikki sort of talked about, too. Um, but one of our questions from our Twitter audience, and I'd like to sort of dig into it a little more because it came up in the previous session, and I'm very curious about it, is the fact that these developments are not necessarily going to make the industry worse. Um, there's a way to, I think, uh, use the advantages of some of these technological developments. Like, you know, you're in the media world, right? I come from the intelligence world where a lot of this technology, I really think can be leveraged to enhance the profession. Uh, for instance, if human intelligence officers don't have to write up transcripts after every meeting um, and they use a lot of that brain power doing so, and maybe a machine can help them do it instead, then they can focus on sort of connecting more dots, recruiting better sources. Um, as you know, human intelligence has a lot of overlap with journalism. So is there room for sort of an enhancement of the, the profession of journalism using new technology? It doesn't just have to be synthetic media, but what, how can technology really help? Yeah, I think transcription services is a really good example. We've also seen Google has rolled out some stuff that helps you to transcribe into a different language. That's a hugely powerful tool because if I'm an American journalist and I break an important story, that might have huge implications for an audience that doesn't speak English, but I don't write in a language other than English. So we can use some of these synthetic tools to help us uh, not just transcribe things, but also to translate them. The other places where it could be helpful is that Journalists become brands within themselves and they have to be in a lot of places at a lot of times. And so if you can use synthetic media to help ease that burden, that would be helpful. So what do I mean by that? Let's say I had to do this CNS, CNAS panel today, but I also had to be somewhere else. You know, in the future, we might be able to use virtual avatars to keep journalists in multiple places. I mean, that could be weaponized, but it also could be incredibly useful. And so to the writer's point that wrote in that question, you know, I can see places in which this could obviously be abused, and that's what most of the media coverage is about. But there are also opportunities for new technologies to improve and to enhance journalism. I think the key is, do we regulate these technologies uh, to a point where it makes it easier for the people who want to use them for good to get access to them and harder for the people who want to use them for bad to not get access to them? And so we'll see what that happens down the pike. 
And I feel like that's our job, right? We're trying to provide policy solutions. We're trying to provide recommendations that, that helps uh, in, in good ways, sort of not uh, bad. But if you could send me that avatar when you get it offline, I will use it for days like today and maybe some staff meetings. I don't know. Um, turning to Twitter though, at uh, Alina Moore says, trying to spot the deep fake on the CNAS 2020 session on synthetic media first thing in the AM has the same effect as a triple shot of espresso. So she's not the only one who was confounded a little bit by some of the things that we saw earlier, but kind of pushing on the, the avatar and, you know, using these technologies for good. Um, you discussed a couple examples, but what do you think about in the next six months? Um, is, is the avatar or the transcription services, is there any other things that we, you're kind of offering a scoop on on how um, these technologies are, are new and could be, you know, helpful in the media landscape? You know, I think one of the, the things that gets lost in a lot of these conversations is it's not just about the synthetic media, but it's also about the context by which it is presented. And so that can often be a clue that will help you determine whether or not is, it is synthetic or it is not. When I talk about using these technologies for good, think about the context. You know, it would be uh, highly unlikely that something like an avatar subscription service, whatever it might be, would be used by a Twitter uh, handle that was not verified. And so it's, it's almost about using those kind of clues to determine whether or not something is likely to be false. In terms of other things we can expect down the pike, you know, we've had a few groups come out and say, we're gonna try to manage deep fakes by using things like watermarks. So a bunch of newsrooms got together and they announced something called Project Origin a few days ago, which is a month leading up to the election, they're going to watermark as many stories as they can and watermark the authentic source. And that watermark will actually fade over time if the media itself is manipulated. Now, for those of you at home who are asking, what the heck is a watermark? A watermark is like a little digital stamp that's invisible to the naked eye, but there are ways to trace it if you have certain tools or technology. Uh, if you ever download a PDF that is like secured and you do, um, you know, control F and you at the owner of the PDF, most likely you'll be able to find hidden watermarks that way. Uh, these media companies are trying to, a month ahead of the election, watermark as much stuff as they can so that if stuff starts to get manipulated, they can track it a little bit better. So that's one of the things I would take a look for uh, leading up to the election in the next six months. So you brought up the election and that's really interesting too, especially when it comes to uh, the media newsrooms themselves. So we'll go to Twitter again. And I thought this was a really interesting comment that we're just getting from at hybrid analysts. Very good discussion on media and verification, as we just talked about, those watermarks, those new technologies. Um, however, Michael talks about being worried on the of shrinking newsrooms and increased fakes. So is there, I think he talked about that cat and mouse game, right? What who's outgunned here? You know, if media, if newsrooms shrink and shrink and shrink and fakes get better and better and better quick more quickly, um, are are we completely gonna be outgunned? How worried are you about 2020, you know, in a landscape that it looks like that. 2020, I think we'll be okay. Down the line, I don't think we're going to be okay. I'm not optimistic. I think journalism is a human uh, skill and source, and it's something that's really important to democracy. And I think we are seeing newsrooms shrink. We don't have a societal economic solution to upholding journalism so that we can better democracy. And at the same time, uh, to Michael's question on Twitter, we are seeing that there are far more advances in technologies to outsmart and manipulate the media at this point that advances to help add journalists to this profession. And so I'm very worried about it deep down uh, moving forward after 2020 in the long term. For now in 2020, it doesn't seem like it's going to threaten our election. It doesn't seem like it's really going to threaten our democracy. Uh, for one, the deep fakes are mature, but they're not uber mature. I mean, with the naked eye, some of the analysts prior to me coming on were able to spot out some of the differences. You know, the guy's hair was not matching his hat, but that is going to become dramatically improved in years uh, to come. We're also going to see, and this is what makes me nervous, you're gonna see a proliferation, proliferation of images going viral and we're not gonna have enough analysts to be able to verify them for us. You know, right now news organizations were relying on those companies and those analysts to verify things in real time. But what happens when we feel like we have to verify every single solitary image and there aren't enough analysts to do so? That is where I'm going to start to get really concerned about getting outgunned. And I think 
what it's going to take is a lot of societal intention to find solutions. And I say societal because it's not going to be a patchwork of efforts that solves this. You know, I'm happy about Project Origin and these news companies that are putting something together. But in order to solve something so massive, we're going to need regulators to start to think about how we you know, really legislate and think about regulating these technologies. It's not going to be something that you can solve in piecemeal. Sarah, that's so true. And, you know, we ran into that issue a lot um, at, in the tech industry, right? So I used to do counterterrorism analysis and we would have these content reviewers and then we'd have automation to kind of look over it as well. And then it was such a problem. The influx of all of this terrorist propaganda and content was so prodigious that, you know, you couldn't have enough human beings, enough analysts, as you say, sort of verifying this in real time. You had to try to automate as much as possible. And even then, you know, hiring 30,000 people, it just doesn't seem to be enough. So totally agree with you that some of the solutions are going to be have to found, found in DC. And for our last question, if you'll permit me to sort of talk about something a little uh, close to my heart, um, TikTok, I think you knew that was coming. Uh, so last week, Amazon appeared to ban the use of TikTok on devices uh, that its employees use to access Amazon email. A few hours later, the company said the directive had been issued in error. It took it back. Now, on your beat specifically, which I think is absolutely fascinating, your stuff is just right at the intersection of, I think, everything that matters today. Uh, you talk to politicians, you talk to cybersecurity experts, technology programmers, um, and I'm assuming your fair share of TikTok teens. Um, and all of these, uh, you know, politicians and whatnot and experts, they, they seem to have a different take on the debate. Um, what do you think? Is there a real national security fear there? Is there an information security fear there? What are you seeing from all of the interviews that you do? And this will be our last one, I promise. Uh, can you repeat the question, information security on what? Yeah, so you seem, everyone seems to have a different take on the national security implications oh. of TikTok. What yes. do you think? Are, do you think there's a real national security fear given China's data guzzling ambitions? Yeah, I do. I think there's data fears anytime you use any app with that collects your data, of course. I think the problem for TikTok is that it's obviously owned by a Chinese company, ByteDance. And if they weren't, you know, worried about the uh, optics of being affiliated with a Chinese owned company, they wouldn't be making all of these efforts to separate themselves. I mean, they hired a US CEO, they created a DC office, they took the head lobbyist from the Internet Association here in DC and made it the head of the DC office. They're trying to spin out a US HQ. They want to put US uh, policies. Also remember the name TikTok is not even used in China, it's Diane. So at the end of the day, they're definitely efforting a separation for a reason. Uh, now, if you were to go on TikTok's policies, it doesn't explicitly say at all that this is what they do, that they store their data in other places, you know, et cetera. But how are we to know and trust that? I mean, we aren't, we have, I think the smartest thing you can do is keep your guard up. Sarah, that is the perfect note to end on, especially as we bring over, you know, four members of our Digital Freedom Forum who actually will talk further about some of these concerns. You raised them perfectly and it was like listening to music. So thank you so much, Sarah. You've given us a lot to think about. And again, you can subscribe to Sarah's weekly Axios Media Trends newsletter today, and she can be found at, at Sarah Fisher on Twitter. Thank you. Appreciate it, Sarah. So. At this point, I'd like to introduce four members of our Digital Freedom Forum. Again, if you're just joining us, the Digital Freedom Forum is a group of senior private sector tech executives, former policymakers, academics, and civil society members dedicated to confronting the illiberal use of technology abroad and finding solutions to promote digital freedom. Please use hashtag 2020 a CNAS 2020 on Twitter for any comments or if you want to ask a question of any of our panel members and there will be plenty of fodder for that uh, given our discussion until four o'clock um, and we'll get to the best questions in the last portion of the panel. So let's turn to our guests today. We have with us Danica Lasnuk. She leads Beta Lab at Betaworks Ventures and this is a startup studio and seed stage VC firm with a focus on the intersection of technology and media we also have Maya Wang, the China Senior Researcher at Human Rights Watch. And we have Dr. Ann Kokas, the Professor of Media Studies at UVA, and Dr. Sheena Greitens. She's a professor at the University of Texas at Austin's LBJ School, and she focuses on Asia, authoritarian policy, politics, and national security. So as our first speaker, I want to turn to Danica. 
Danica, so I, I don't know if you got to see all of the results of that exercise. Again, if you're just joining us in the audience, we had a synthetic media exercise where we threw up static images, we threw up video, we threw up all kinds of audio and text, and we challenged our audience to see if they could spot a digital forgery or you know any synthetic media. And I'm so happy that Danica's here because her firm basically coined the phrase synthetic media. And Danica, can you talk about some of the dangers? But again, like I talked with Sarah, like some of the good things that synthetic media has to offer. You know, I don't want to continue to have this sort of a pall of of woe over all of these conversations. I want to I want to make sure that especially with our digital freedom initiative at CNAS that we're talking about ways that technology can help with digital freedom and not just hurt it. Hey Kara, thank you. So, you know, when we think about synthetic media and if you can put yourself in the shoes of a startup founder for a minute, right? They're starting a company because they think they can build some technology that will solve a real problem in the world. And sometimes it's a really big problem. And sometimes it's a problem um, that's specific to an area of their life that they've experienced before. And a lot of times the, the early days of synthetic media, we were looking at tools to democratize creative pursuits, right? Filmmaking, um, advertising, things like that. So if I can use synthetic media to create an artist, to create an avatar, to create a voice of someone who doesn't exist, that as a, as a let's say a student filmmaker, an indie filmmaker that lowers you know, some of my costs that allows me to do more with less and potentially you know, share my voice and share my vision. And so I like to remind myself that a lot of these tools come out of you know, what can we do with AI and generative technology and apply it to some areas that um, right now there's this you know, huge gap or there has traditionally been a huge gap between what studios can do and produce and what you know, individuals or indies can do and produce, right? Of course, um, also technologists only think about that use case. And it's very difficult when you're just trying to get your company off the ground to think about how could my technology, how could my product, how could this thing I built or invented be used um, for someone who isn't just trying to create a student film or isn't just trying to make a cheaper commercial, um, but you know, wants to apply it to other places. So I think there's a lot of creative applications that are really, really interesting. Um, one I saw, one that kind of came out in the last two weeks is a company that we have invested in called Radical. Um, and what they do is allow uh, kind of without the intense rigging and, and hardware and camera setup that you would need to do 3D motion capture, that you can input a 2D video and they can render it in full 3D, which you can then put into a video game or a movie or um, any other piece of video. Um, and it's remarkable what they can do with that technology but you can certainly imagine that somebody could put a lifelike skin over that avatar and have you know, a, a puppet essentially created. That is not their intention. That's not how people are using it today. But when we talk about bad actors, you know, we, we work with our companies on how do we guard against some of those things. Okay, now that you've wet my appetite, I'm gonna be a little sly here um, and ask you, uh, given all your workshops and everything that you do, what are some of the most promising digital defenses that you think you are, you're helping incubate today or that you're even seeing today um, against the illiberal use of synthetic media? So you talk about how um, some of these developments can be perverted. What do you think can help defend against it from you know, the conversations that you're having with these programmers on the ground? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things. One is awareness, and that's not a technological solution. That's, you know, do we make sure we're having these conversations amongst ourselves on larger and larger stages? Do we educate our, the technology community and for us in particular, the companies we're working with? Because if you know that the problem exists, um, as a, you know, as a creator, as a builder, you want to go fix that problem. So, so that's one. Um, but specifically thinking about companies, there are a few that we've invested in. Deep Trace is one. I don't, they might have come up today, but they're the deep fake detec detection company. And they're kind of at this forefront of a new wave, I think, of a new kind of cybersecurity, if you will, right? So, so they have a deep fake detector. We've spent a lot of time talking about that today. 
um, that can identify videos or images that have been manipulated or generated by um, a GAN um, or other sort of AI technology. Similarly, uh, on this on the voice side, on the speech side, you know, same thing. The companies that can generate synthetic voice are best positioned to create the tools to identify synthetically generated audio or voice. Um, and so we're really, we really like to see these tools. And uh, one that I know of, again, a, a company that we've invested in is called Resemble AI. And so they have voice generation technology. They also have um, identification. And then a third area that we're seeing emerging right now, which is very, very interesting, is um, using natural language processing to identify sort of emerging false narratives. And whether those are perpetrated by humans or bots, um, but, but starting to be able to use AI and what we know about things like GTP2, GTP3, um, and sort of reverse apply it and say, does this thing that's picking up traction on Twitter, this story, is it written like it's real? Does it sound the way humans sound or is it too similar to itself? And it's kind of a single line of text, a single idea that's kind of perpetrated by many different accounts. And that could be a signal. So it's both looking at the heuristics and then actually looking at the language itself. Um, and there's kind of a, a coming generation of companies that we're starting to see that are working on uh, things like that to be able to help us identify, help journalists, but also help us citizens identify, um, is what I'm looking at likely to be organic, i.e. human created? Um, and then we can figure out if it's true, but first figure out what the source is and what the sort of instantiation of that piece of information is. And I think there's a lot of ways that that can help the media industry too, especially as you know, as Sarah laid out, they're being targeted now. Like it's not like uh, you just have these engagement on Facebook posts and social media by nation state actors like Russia and China anymore. They're figuring out ways to distribute this information that looks really organic, that really plays on people's you know cognitive security. So the last question then I'll ask you, and this is sort of a, a looking forward. Hopefully we had more of a positive tenor for uh, the. First First part of our conversation, but in terms of what you're worried about, and you gave us great examples of, you know, NLP and reverse engineering, um, some of the ways that that's used. But are you most worried about uh, manipulations of text, um, these static images? People seem to be in our exercise earlier. They seem to be pretty good at identifying static images. Again, our CNAS audience, we're going to assume that there's um, a lot of sophistication there. But I think you know, video is getting tougher. Audio is getting tougher. Um, what medium do you think is going to be most difficult to guard against? Um, and then I'll, I'll leave you alone and we'll broaden the aperture a little bit to more regional perspectives of media technology and synthetic media. Yeah, I mean, when you look at sort of generation, I think, you know, realistic video, uh, deepfake video generation um, is still coming, right? We, we have good deepfakes. Um, but it's hard still to generate a long piece of content, a significant piece of content that doesn't give itself away. Um, but honestly, rather than a particular type of media, I'm actually more worried about um, the human manipulation, sort of what we like to call shallow fakes. I think you guys, you know, shallow fakes, cheap fakes, there's a lot of terms there. Um, but things like you see on Twitter, it's a genuine photograph. It hasn't been manipulated. It would not be picked up by a detector, but it's taken out of context. It's attribute, it's misattributed. Um, you're not seeing the broader picture of, you know, so it's zoomed in in such a way that um, without seeing the rest of that context or, or being given it, just regular sort of media consumers um, can very easily take that and either make assumptions or believe the sort of author or the original poster's assumptions. And, and, and very currently, we're seeing a lot of that here in this country, both around um, the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests. We saw a lot of misinformation flying around, around who was behind the protests and, and frankly, you know, very shallow faked evidence that you know this was organized by some greater body and not an uprising of the people um and and so i think things like that are concerning and and keep journalists really busy and there are quite a few who are doing this trying to verify the source of information find the original context for a photo or um particularly you know on social media i think about photos 
um, and sort of zoom back, if you will, and give consumers, give regular citizens, you know, a, a broader point of view around what might be going on and how easy it is to manipulate a narrative that way. Danica, that's fantastic. And, you know, it's rare that you get somebody who has her hands on the data, somebody who's working with the programmers and software engineers to develop these um, digital defenses. So thank you for that unique take. Um, but I do, I'll, you know, stay on and we'll, we'll see what this looks like from a broader angle, right? We'll bring in more of a, a focused geopolitical uh, cognition here. Um, of course, we are talking about China. Uh, so China is what my CNAS colleagues have called the bleeding edge of using technology to enforce control on its people and even export that influence and technology to the rest of the world. Luckily, we have a glut of China experts here with us today. And again, if you want to take advantage of the expertise we have in this room, please ask our panelists a question on Twitter using hashtag CNAS2020. And I'll turn to Dr. Koskas. Uh, Anne, you've done a lot of work on digital media, especially on the relationship between China and Hollywood, super interesting, and how China exercises its influence in spheres we wouldn't normally expect. You know, I kind of had a little bit of fun with Sarah talking about TikTok because um, I kind of, I look at TikTok on Instagram, I'm, I'm not on <laughs> it at all, but you know, it's, it's really interesting to see how it pervades its influence in these ways that you wouldn't expect. And it seems pretty consistent with the themes of the Chinese party state. So what are you seeing that's sort of standing out to you today? Yeah, so the way that I think of it as, as, a, as actually um, breaking down into three separate categories. So one is looking at the relationship between China as a nation state and its ability to gather and generate data. Um, so this idea of cyber sovereignty versus the US multi-stakeholderism, which is this idea that um, companies and governments and non-governmental organizations all, all control and own data. Um, and then within the context of TikTok, there's the question of, like where, what hardware is being used and then what, um, what, what services are being used. So this, this brings us to the debate between TikTok and Huawei. So how we control um, access to different Chinese apps. Then finally, getting to your question, is this relationship between content and metadata and essentially like what content is fed to us as part of our TikTok experience, like what's on the For You page, what you can search for versus something like the um, like a face swapping app on TikTok that can be used to help train deep fakes um, like Danica was talking about or um, the ways in which metadata can be used in order to actually model populations and population level behavior. And those are the areas which in my research I find really interesting because it's the sort of, re it's the sort of reason why US platforms for entertainment have had a really difficult time entering the Chinese market because precisely of the type of data that they're able to, that they're able to gather and that they would be able to gather, that the Chinese government is gathering or that the Chinese companies are gathering in the US and could potentially be used by the Chinese government. So I think something that we all need to think about given the fact that we are actually using this platform right now, um, can you talk a little bit about your take on Zoom? and China's regulations on digital content. I mean, it's a fascinating intersection of, you know, some of the work that you started years and years ago, and now it's sort of coming out when there's an onus on US tech companies to, to make big decisions. What's your take on that? Are you seeing something to be worried about like we talked about with Sarah and TikTok? Well, I think this is a really great example of this kind of dynamic between multi-stakeholderism and cyber sovereignty. So Zoom on June 4th cut off access of Chinese activists who were having a conversation with people in the US um, and they were doing that in, in concert with Chinese national law. So, this, so they were legally following Chinese laws. Um, however, in the US there aren't laws like that. So as a result, we're in this kind of strange situation where because of China's more demanding regulatory environment, companies that are trying to operate transnationally are trying to thread the needle um, in order to be able to potentially access both markets. This is even more difficult as a result of the Hong Kong national security law. And we're seeing companies that have only paused their data sharing with the Hong Kong police, but haven't necessarily decided one way or the other if they're going to stay in the Hong Kong market or leave. Now, the other reason why Zoom is so important and so interesting is because we're in this COVID-19 moment universities are moving online and they're using Zoom 
And there are a lot of Chinese students who can't come back to the US. Now, because of China's kind of broader cyber sovereignty framework, and in particular, a December 2019 regulation of the internet, it means that US professors, platforms, um, potentially universities, and also potentially students could be held criminally or civilly liable if the content that they are, they are receiving from their US university is, viol is considered to be in violation of China's national security. And these are very, very broadly written laws. So it's a real potential risk that we're coming up against very, very soon. So that brings up another point. I mean, this is kind of sort of the non-sexy, you know, weaponization of things like policies and laws that right. govern technology and the use of technology. And a lot of people um, that you're familiar with, you know, my old colleague at Facebook, Alex Stamos, has talked about how, you know, there are sorts of things that can provide leverage over data. So you're not just saying that these, you know, uh, tech uh, implements or, you know, any hardware or software, they're sort of sucking up real-time data and we should be worried about that because there's some sort of you know data visualization platform displaying everyone in America's you know data in real time they're not talking about that we're talking about a whole ecosystem right of, of laws of technologies of people really of markets and actors that you know really make a difference when it comes to data security so the laws and what worries me most is they're sort of creating models and exporting these you know models of laws we talk a lot about Zimbabwe and um, you know Uganda, other areas that have taken you know the cybersecurity uh, policy governing structure that you talked about, and they're saying, okay, you know we're authoritarians, and uh, this kind of looks good for us. Are you worried about you know the the confrontation between uh, open societies and you know the way that we we run our laws, and then those laws sort of metastasizing across the globe? Is that too alarmist? Yeah. So I think that I think that this is why precisely it's so important to think about the relationship between regulations and hardware and services all as one kind of continuum for forms of illiberal tech, tech governance and forms of export. So some countries may adopt one of these approaches. Some countries may adopt multiple approaches. So like in some countries we've seen Chinese, um, Chinese built data centers, for example, like in Tanzania. In other countries, and I'm sure, uh, or Shino will be, um, will be, is apt to talk about this, um, the export of law enforcement systems um, that use Chinese that use Chinese run surveillance technologies, um, and then in the U.S. we're seeing the export of entertainment platforms like TikTok, or previously we saw um, Grinder, the Chinese run LGBTQ um, IA dating platform that was divested by a Chinese by the Chinese owner Kunlun Tech as a result of CFIUS action, but we don't know what happened to that data. Um, after it was moved to China for um, for the Chinese firm, it's not clear that 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 the data that was gathered was moved back as part of the as part of the proposed divestment. So um, so there are a lot of different ways, and I think China has been very creative in terms of approaching this by identifying potential tools for the toolbox. And one thing I think that you hear so much is that these, a lot of these Chinese tech companies are, you know, given that murky relationship they have with the party state, they're sort of saying, no way, you know, if Beijing, if they come at our door and they say, give us, you know, all of this data, they're like, absolutely not, we will not do it. But, you know, who knows in, in the final run what they'll actually do. Um, so speaking of all of that, Maya, um, I want to turn to Maya Wang, the, the senior China researcher for Human Rights Watch. And Maya, you pioneered so many efforts to, to show how China uses technology to suppress its internal population. Um, your work in Xinjiang with um, the IJOP, the Integrated Joint Operations Platform, um, was, I mean, the first of its kind. You're, you're really the lodestar when it comes to all of this work. Can you talk a little bit about that um, sort of sort of your work in Xinjiang and and what you're really seeing now when it comes to the use of technology to suppress uh, an internal population. Thank you for having me. Um, and um, I am really happy to be here. Um, and I'm sorry I cannot join you um, on video. Um, I think, first of all, I, we need to kind of talk a little bit about the situation in Xinjiang more as a whole um, for uh, the country of China. The Chinese government has been putting in place this kind of mass surveillance systems and data collection schemes 
for a long time, essentially um, as early as year 2000 with the Golden Shield project or even before. Um, so it's a multi kind of layered system uh, starting with the collection. Well, first of all, there's an ID, national ID system where everybody is required to have an ID number. And then at the next level of that is the requirement of um, a real, uh, the real name registration system that you, when you register for your phone, uh, to go on the internet, um, to take the long distance bus, you are required to um, present your ID and that information is tagged onto kind of your movement or, or what you're up to. And then at the next level of that is a collection of biometrics. And this is a lot of what we have documented in the last two, uh, three years. Um, the Chinese government has been collecting uh, people's faces, um, uh, facial images, voices, voice samples, um, even their DNA. Um, and in Xinjiang, there have also been reports of the authorities collecting people's gait, the way they walk. Um, and the collection of biometrics um, is um, that those biometrics are inputted into um, national databases um, that are searchable. And that information don't sit on their own databases. They, the Chinese government has also been um, uh, uh, has been working very hard to integrate a lot of that data. So the Chinese police, uh, the Ministry of Public Security is at the forefront of these mass surveillance systems. And um, you can see how information is integrated most with um, the use of integrated joint operations platform, which you just mentioned in Xinjiang. Um, in Xinjiang, the, I'm sure that the use of political education camps to in turn uh, near um, an estimated a million Turkey Muslims there is a well known uh, reported uh, situation. Um, but beyond that, the use of mass surveillance also means that this in this region of essentially about 22, 23 million people half of which are Turkic Muslims, are living in a kind of, um, well, uh, um, uh, uh, living within a set of virtual fences um, that are enabled through the use of mass surveillance systems uh, plus checkpoints. So the way it works is that the integrated joint operations platform is kind of like the mother system of many of these mass surveillance systems that holds um, and keep a dynamic watch over what people are up to. So our research on the IJOP app, so there's an app that is connected to the IJOP system. The app is installed on officials' phones and these officials are um, receive notifications about people whom they are in their jurisdictions. Um, so if someone in their jurisdictions um, use too much electricity, the IJOP app would uh, notify the government officials to go and check on the reasons why this person ha has used too much electricity. And on that form in the app, the government officials are required to take off boxes like, oh, they use too much electricity because they are farmers, or that day they have turned on all the appliances, or perhaps they have some kind of cutting tools that are hidden away that, oh, that, that means suspiciousness. Um, so the IJOP, the IJOP app, um, links all of this information together, monitoring not only electricity use, but also like, um, does this person carry an extra phone? Uh, does that person's phone somehow um, has been um, not been used in the last month and therefore indicates suspiciousness? Um, has this person driven to the gas station um, too many times of that uh, during the day? And all of that information is also integrated with the region's facial recognition cameras um, and the checkpoints so that when people pass through checkpoints every day, and there are lots of checkpoints in that region, uh, about 500 meters in, in cities and at, at every access point to villages, um, that information, the movement information is locked. So as their, um, the information about the identifying uh, numbers on the phone. So this is how the authorities get to know whether or not someone is carrying an extra phone or whether or not someone is carrying a phone that doesn't belong to them. So I, I'm just outlining the many different forms of behavior the IJOP system tracks, including people's movements, their relationships, uh, who, who are they talking to and whether or not they enter their, their homes through the front or the back door. So it's a very kind of comprehensive way of monitoring people's behavior um, uh, in a multifaceted way. And the way it works is, is that when people pass us through these checkpoints is also how they are um, um, regulated. So certain people, especially people who have left a political education camps or are related to people who have relatives in political education camps, 
they could be restricted in their movement to only their villages or the locales or let's say Kashka uh, prefecture, and they're not allowed to go out of that prefecture. Other people who are less suspicious from the government's perspective are allowed to roam a little bit further to maybe Urumqi, but beyond that, they're not allowed to leave uh, perhaps Xinjiang uh, and all of the people in, in, this, in the Xinjiang region have had their passports confiscated. Um, and that's why, and I'm, I'm just sketching out how life um, work, uh, life is like living in Xinjiang. Um, and that's why I think what is happening in Xinjiang is an unprecedented um, form of governance of authoritarianism that is, we have never seen any other government that is able to have such intrusive control over people's lives over such a large area of a country. So Maya, I think you you have uttered the most important words of the day. And I'm a little biased because this is a personal bugaboo, but data integration. You know, data is only good so far as you can do something with it, right? If we can get value out of it. So, you know, in the government, it's sort of like if you have these siloed systems, I don't care how much data they're sucking up. I don't care what the immutable characteristics are, but if these systems can't talk to each other and you can't sync and fuse this data to sort of spit out a assessments, then they're not going to be as good as they can be to the ability to exploit that data with, you know, two different disparate systems and connecting it. That is critical. And if the Chinese party state is able to do that, I think uh, we have a lot to be worried about in terms of internal repression. So my last question to you before we move to Sheena is, you know, what can the United States do to confront it? Uh, we saw the, the sanctions from China on certain U.S. politicians, uh, Rubio and Cruz and others. So, you know, what can the U.S. do to, to contest uh, this pretty much assault on their own people and now something that's spreading out to our own policymakers? I think there is a, an urgent need for more research on how the U.S. technology uh, companies and academics are facilitating uh, the construction of the mass surveillance state in China. Um, and I believe that research is just the beginning. Um, and then once we know more about how this actually works is to put, I think, sanctions and, and export controls um, while respecting uh, academic freedom. <laughs> so so the, the line has to be carefully drawn so that we're not stopping any kind of research uh, interaction between American and Chinese researchers, but at the same time, anything that is to, uh, uh, contributing towards the abuse of human rights have to be stopped. Um, I think that's one thing, one important area uh, is, is understanding and, and, and action concerning export control. Um, another area is the fact that I think it's also recognizing that US companies have themselves been pioneering some of the most invasive um, abusive technologies concerning the use of facial recognition. It's not used to the same degree, and I'm not drawing the equivalence here. Um, U.S. also has um, civil society, free press to expose and discuss many of this use of techno uh, nefarious technologies. But at the same time, the U.S. is a thought leader um, that has enabled the Chinese government to point and say, hey, but it's being used in the U.S. So I think data protection uh, and privacy protections in the US, um, if they become law and addressing these kind of massive data collection by American uh, companies will also be important um, to, uh, in, in a roundabout way, to address some of the surveillance and dystopia that is currently taking place in China. Awesome, thank you so much, Maya. Again, if you're listening or watching, you can ask our panelists a question on Twitter using hashtag CNAS2020. And now, Sheena, I can tell you're chomping at the bit. Uh, you uh, you co-authored a banger of an article in Foreign Affairs last month called China's Troubling Vision for the Future of Public Health, Why Beijing's Model Must Not Become the World. So can you kind of cheat for us and give us a little bit about the effects of the pandemic on surveillance and the liberal uses of technology worldwide? Kind of wrap it all up for us if you could. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, for organizing the the panel today. It's terrific to be to be part of this conversation and to get this uh, diverse range of perspectives and types of expertise. Um, the piece that um, Julian Gewurz and I wrote in in Foreign Affairs um, last week made three basic points about how we think that the pandemic will impact 
some of the global trends that we're seeing in um, surveillance, civil liberties, and democracy, the quality of democracy worldwide. Um, you know, first, we talk about the effect that the pandemic has had in China, and that China has developed a model um, in the last six, seven, eight months that really relies on fusing health and public security. And surveillance is the place where those two overlap. So China uses a phrase that means prevention and control. It actually uses it to mean both prevention and control of epidemics and prevention and control of political risk. And it's become a sort of key policing doctrinal term under Xi Jinping um, that, that really symbolizes and encapsulates his push to construct a more complete surveillance state that um, not only addresses risks to the CCP's control of society after they emerge, but actually prevents them from emerging in the first place. Maya's done some fantastic research on the manifestations of that way of thinking in Xinjiang in particular, um, but we've actually seen the construction of these types of systems even as early as the mid-2000s um, in, in major eastern cities in China, um, but that process has been incredibly intensified and augmented under, under Xi Jinping since around 2013. Um, so China's model in particular, um, the pandemic has allowed the party state to collect vast amounts of health data via new you know, forms of health surveillance. Um, but what's important, I was glad that you mentioned the key role of data integration, because what's important about that is that the data is integrated very quickly um, if not in real time, very close to it, with the public security apparatus that has already been working on integrating diverse sources of data and using them to manage risks to CCP control. Um, and so that, that model of fusing public health and public security in China is the, the sort of the, the model that China is presenting to the world in papers, white papers by the state council, in its media, in its propaganda efforts, in the way that it distributes foreign aid. It's saying, look, this is our model for dealing with the pandemic. Um, and, and so the second point that we make in the article is that Chinese surveillance technology was already in fairly widespread around the world. So I, I worked on a report that came out with Brookings earlier this spring, where we found that Chinese surveillance platforms, including platforms with that data integration capability, are already present in at least 80 countries around the world, and it's a mix of democracies and non-democratic systems. Um, and so the, a lot of those countries aren't necessarily interested, at least on the face of it, in illiberal uses of the technology from the get-go. They're actually interested in the technology because it can solve problems like urban safety and violent crime. And so they're using it in a more law enforcement-oriented way rather than political policing, right? And, and that depends not so much on the technology, but the laws, policies, and regulations, like Anne mentioned, that, that govern um, uh, you know, how the technology can and can't be used, how the data can and can't be viewed and, and utilized. Um, and so given that there's already been this demand and spread of Chinese surveillance technology, um, the idea that the pandemic could accelerate demand, and especially accelerate demands in places that are desperate for a solution to the challenges posed by COVID-19, um, is this the second key point that we make in the article, that, um, that there's a real risk in the U.S. and, and like-minded democracies should not underestimate the, um, the appeal or potential appeal of the model that China has developed and is, is offering the world. Um, so those are two kind of depressing points. Um, the third point, I hope, will be a little more of an, an opportunity to think creatively about constructive policy, which is that, um, that that potential for demand for Chinese surveillance technology and the spread of a, a Chinese surveillance model is there. Um, but democracies have a model that we could be drawing on and augmenting as an alternative for dealing with public health and even public health surveillance tools in ways that are much more compatible with democracy, civil liberties, privacy, um, and the things that, that we know democratic citizens care about and that make democratic um, life uh, distinguishable. Um, and so 
what I mean by that is that if you look at places that d democracies that have done a, rel a sort of relatively capable job, as we stand here in, in mid July 20, uh, 2020, um, you know, South Korea, Taiwan, um, New Zealand, some of America's best partners and allies in the Indo Pacific have an alternative. And the democratic alternative does involve some surveillance, right? So, so you still have some of these tech tools being used to monitor citizens, but the policies are characterized, I think, by three key features. And we outline this in the article. First, the scope of the data collection is limited. So um, actors are limited on in terms of what type of data they can collect on citizens and also who in this integrated system can actually view the data. Um, so it's limited in scope. Uh, it's limited in time, so the data collection is temporary. Um, Taiwan has an, a, an audit process that is already announced to ensure that data that's collected will be deleted when the pandemic is over, um, or it has to be deleted after, you know, say, a 14-day quarantine. And then... Did I lose you there? Just a bit, but we are still listening. Sorry, did I lose you there? We got you back, Sheena. Okay, I apologize. Um, so the, the idea here is that the democratic model is, is limited in the scope of the data that is, can be collected and viewed by the government. It is limited in time and that it's temporary and it's subject to democratic review in that so, for example, Korea makes certain data transparent so citizens can monitor the government in, on a daily basis in terms of what data has been collected. In Taiwan, there's both judicial and legislative review processes that are outlined in law. Um, and so these three features, making the data, um, the use of health surveillance temporary, scope limited, and subject to democratic oversight and review, um, offer, I think, a real democratic alternative um, and so the main suggestion we make is that the U.S. and its democratic partners and allies really come together and need to offer that as an alternative. I think that is wonderful and extremely comprehensive and almost just an untouchable thing that we could, that is concrete, that we can talk to, that things like our digital freedom forum can discuss amongst the people who are actually, you know, making these decisions within tech companies, people who are staffing these policymakers who are, you know, making the rules that, that govern the use and the collection and the sharing of technology. Um, one thing I think I'd add and, and something that people talk about a lot now is sort of a, a privacy by design element. So the ability of, mm. you know, tech companies and programmers to, to sort of, um, engage in you know machine learning to to prevent say a the transfer of data to a centralized hub um, to keep it decentralized differential privacy all kinds of things that in the engineering design phase of a lot of these technologies can sort of help um, confront the, an issue that we know as Maya talked about as Anne talked about as Danica talked about as you just mentioned um, can be problematic down the line when it comes to uh, repression and the mass surveillance and collection of data on individuals that allow places like the Chinese party state to wreck havoc. So um, I do, we are over time. So I am sorry to our audience if we didn't get to your questions, but I just want to thank all of our panelists. I mean, I cannot envision a better breadth of expertise um, for than all the women who are here from Danica and your work uh, with the lab uh, to Sheena. Um, good luck in your next venture at the University of Texas at Austin. I am jealous of them for getting you um, and jealous of you as well. Um, and thank you so much. You work at the best university in the nation and Maya you are again as I said just uh, you know I, I hold you in such high esteem you're doing uh, pioneering work and um, please do not stop um, and as we conclude I just want to extend another thank you to our conference sponsors our institutional donors you made today's discussion possible and the audience you know how can I forget your participation in today's event um, really is going to help us going forward when we talk about social sector awareness and how savvy uh, the American audience is when it comes to our democratic institutions and sort of ensuring uh, security, election integrity, and cognitive security. So this concludes our event. Thank you very much for joining. We'll see you at um, the next event in our summer series, which is the Defense Wargaming session, this time next week.
July 22nd. It's called A Deadly Game, East China Sea Crisis 2030. And it will take place next Wednesday from 1 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. We'll see you then.